Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Um, I think you all know me, but just in case, I'm Peggy Fogelman, the Norma Jean Calderwood Director here at the Gardner Museum. And I'm so happy that you are able to join for today's virtual patron event, Persephone Rising. Um, I wanna give a special thank you to all of our friends of Fenway Court who are with us this afternoon because your support makes so much of what we do um, possible here at the Gardner. And for instance, it allows us to raise a 2000 year old, five foot tall, 1000 pound Greek goddess from the sunken marshlands of the Boston Fens. No easy feat. The raising of Persephone, the goddess of the underworld, was an all hands on deck project and really a great credit to the staff in figuring out how to make this all happen in the midst of all the COVID restrictions. Um, as we highlight our conservation department today and their incredible work with the sculpture, I'd like to spend a few moments just to let you know about some other things that are happening at the Gardner. So first of all, yes, we are open. I'm sitting here in my office. Um, in fact, we reopened in July and we've had a very successful return. Our facilities and operations team have um, done a really terrific job in pivoting to time tickets, um, doubling down on cleaning and sanitation and restructuring the flow of our lobby and our visitor traffic. Uh, the frontline team members have also all undergone COVID specific trainings for visitor safety. And this is all to keep both our public and our staff safe and comfortable while they enjoy the museum. Now, due to the city and state guidelines, our capacity has been limited. So we're at about 30% um, of typical attendance, but the numbers are gradually increasing while we still remain within the guidelines. A great silver lining to our capacity restrictions is that it allows our visitors to spend some quieter moments with the collection and experience the courtyard in a more intimate way. And as I'm sure so many of you would agree, the beauty of the museum is itself very therapeutic. Um, so this more intimate experience only amplifies that magic. Um, the restorative power of art is something that our visitors have remarked on repeatedly uh, since we first reopened in July. And there are many, many shared stories of remarkable guest experiences, um, but one particularly stood out and I thought I'd share it with you, um, possibly because the story takes place in front of one of my favorite paintings at the Gardner, El Halejo. So on one of our first days back in action, a woman was actually quietly sobbing in the Spanish cloister by Sargent's painting. So of course, a member of our security team went over to make sure she was okay, um, and uh, she said that she was so happy and so grateful to be able to once again see in person her favorite painting that she was moved to tears. So while we don't typically aim to make our visitors cry, in this case, they were tears of joy. Um, as more and more visitors return and share similar experiences with us, we've begun offering more free hours and more free digital programming um, to connect with our local community and also our increasingly expansive online international audience um, without any financial barriers to entry. So we recently launched a new initiative, First Free Thursday Evenings, where attendance is free from 3 p.m. to 9 p.m. on the first Thursday of every month. Um, on October 12th, we celebrated Indigenous Peoples Day with free admission and a digital program from our local Indigenous collaborators. And we saw a really fantastic response to this offering, both in person and online. Um, and while Boston's Apollo um, exhibition, which uh, we were very sad to see, closed on October 12th, I hope that you'll all take some time to explore the virtual programming that we created for it. Um, these uh, extraordinary programs and conversations and performances really explore the issues embedded in the art that are so central to our lives and the lives of our communities today. While the pandemic has meant unprecedented challenges, the Gardner has remained committed to living and advancing the core values of our strategic plan, which are really more relevant now than they ever were. Um, in fact, it's the strategic plan's uh, one-year birthday because it was released to the public on, uh, in October of 2019, and it highlighted four core values, 
Creativity is our legacy. Community is our purpose. The collection is our catalyst. Diversity, equity, and inclusion are our commitments. And while we know there's still so much more work to do, living these values has already yielded tremendous successes. For example, Boston's Apollo and its programs, deepened relationships with our local artistic community, new collection-based scholarship, and new artistic commissions. And this work continues with exhibitions and programs that regardless of subject, continue to holistically explore what it means to ask new questions, embrace new perspectives, and partner with community voices. The challenges are significant. Um, working this way in such a collaborative manner isn't, um, isn't really easy. It takes a lot of time and we sometimes make mistakes, but the opportunities are limitless. And so to that end, here are a few things that we've been up to. We reimagined our partnership with Boston Public Schools by pivoting from in-person to remote learning, offering ongoing arts education to nearly 3,000 students from schools in neighborhoods all across the city. And if you heard the news today, um, you'll, you'll understand how important that is um, since uh, all schools are now fully virtual um, for the foreseeable future. We transformed the Gardner Gallery experience with safe, touch-free digital mobile guides that provide in-depth information, exploration, and engagement with the collection that you can get on site, but you can also um, get at home on your mobile device. Uh, we continue to support our local artistic community with new digital commissions. And we completed a lighting update in the early Italian room um, that really improves the visibility in the entire space and illuminate some of our favorite works of art. And all these achievements are made possible through the generosity of our patrons and supporters like you. Um, we really couldn't do this work without you. And um, in, in reference to that, as you know from an email that went out this week, the Gardner has a really exciting opportunity to secure a new grant that will provide long-term support for our horticulture program. And it comes with an invitation for everyone to make a gift to any area of endowment and have that gift matched one-to-one. -one. Um, so just like gifts of annual support, the endowment contributes vital funds every year for um, all the programs that I just mentioned and so much more. So thanks so much for keeping an eye out for more information about this great opportunity. So now for today's program. Um, it, is, uh, it is my honor to introduce um, Holly Salman, our John L. and Susan K. Gardner Director of Conservation, um, who led a team of conservators, engineers, and specialists in raising our ancient Greek sculpture of Persephone from the underworld back to the position that uh, was originally intended by Isabella. Holly's been a key member of the Gardner team since 2004, and she's been integral to um, basically every major conservation project that we've done at the museum, including the conservation of the Farnese sarcophagus and the restoration of the Raphael room and um, the upcoming uh, refurbishment of the Titian room, which has just gotten underway. Um, Holly's going to be speaking to us um, about um, this project and giving us a sense of all the work that was involved in um, such a complicated but such a, a rewarding um, enhancement to our courtyard. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Holly. Okay, thank you so much. It's really exciting to talk with you all today. Um, about this beautifully carved marble sculpture of Persephone. We'll be reviewing the complicated and dramatic project, as Peggy uh, mentioned, to restore her prominent position in Isabella Stewart Gardner's courtyard. But first, a little bit of background on the goddess Persephone. In Greek mythology, she is the daughter of Zeus and Demeter, wife of Hades and the feared queen of the underworld. And here we see Persephone and Hades at the center of a funerary vessel, surrounded by many other mythological figures. The most prominent tale of Persephone recounts how she was abducted by Hades and brought into the underworld, causing her mother Demeter to mourn her loss uh, through the winter months. Each year, Persephone rises out of the underworld, returning to the earth 
reinstilling Demeter's joy and the spring season. For this reason, ancient believers worshiped Persephone in hopes of bringing a fruitful harvest and figures such as this one and gardeners may have held an attribute such as a sheaf of grain in the missing arms. The marble of gardeners Persephone was likely sculpted during the first century BC or AD. And although her clothing and hairstyle are from the fourth century BC indicating that this may be an early copy. The circumstances under which Isabella acquired the sculpture are documented in a letter written to her by Richard Norton, son of the art historian Charles Elliot Norton. His letter from May of 1901 includes details about several antiquities that he thinks Gardner might like to acquire. Of the Persephone, he wrote, now there is another statue here, a replica of, but better than, one in Vienna. The one here is certainly a very lovely thing and in an extraordinarily fine condition, only the forearms being gone. The nose is even preserved. If you decide on it, cable the word Vienna. And then uh, he's referring to Ned Warren, a member of a wealthy Boston family who acquired art and often gave it to the Museum of Fine Arts. Of Warren, he says, Warren is trying to get it, I have reason to believe, but my hold is secure, I think, for some days. From your personal point of view, I do not know whether it will please you or not, but from the point of view of Greek sculpture, you ought to have it. And have it, she did. Gardner purchased the sculpture one month later uh, for 30,000 lira. At this time, Gardner was just completing construction of her museum, where she saw to every detail of the project, as well as the subsequent installation of the collection. And here you see Isabella climbing a ladder to personally check on the construction progress. Her placement of Persephone anchors one corner of the museum's central courtyard and is one of the first things that visitors see upon entering. However, the sight of Persephone rising above the courtyard flowers and plants and requiring visitors to look up at her is not how we saw her over a century later. The queen of the underworld was getting a little too close to that world. It was a distinct alteration of Gardner's intent that we wish to correct. But before reviewing how we brought her back, let's look at how this happened. When Gardner was looking for a location for her museum, she turned to the Fenway neighborhood, which was being redesigned by landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted. And here, Gardner is actually the passenger in this carriage riding through the Fenway neighborhood, which at the time was largely undeveloped, allowing her to erect a monument that would not be overshadowed by other buildings for some years. However, it was all former marshland that had been filled in following a massive fire in the Back Bay in 1872 and a public health, health initiative to improve water quality in Boston through Olmsted's design. And as you can see here and, and still see today across the Fenway, the museum is just a few feet away from the muddy river. So to construct the building, piles were driven into the ground to support the foundation and the large granite uh, stones that make up the courtyard perimeter. The courtyard itself seen in the lower half of this image was treated like any garden courtyard and no support was put in place or seemed necessary. The courtyard and its contents uh, began to drop lower almost immediately after installation. We've learned that this is normal settling, um, particularly on landfill. And as we can see from archival photographs, including this one in the 19, uh, from the 1930s, um, that settling is apparent and Persephone's base in this case appears much shorter. This photograph is not long after Gardner passed away, indicating that she witnessed some of this settling herself. However, the entire courtyard settled fairly evenly, but Persephone continued to drop down even more. And you can see this in a series of images, starting with this photo, which is from 1903, so the year the museum opened. If you pay attention to the archway behind Persephone, you can see that by 1915, she's a bit lower. And 20 years or so later, she's even lower and now lost under the palm. Now, if we look back at these last two images, it's also interesting to note what else changes. 
So here's 1915, and there's actually no sculpture in this corner. Fast forward to 1937, and here we find a new sculpture. Let's take a moment to examine the Grecian figure that faces Persephone, because these two figures had a connection long before they stood across from each other in Gardner's courtyard. Like Persephone, this is a marble sculpture that is likely a copy of an original from the fifth century BC. Its head, which is now lost, was probably carved from a separate piece of marble and attached to the cavity in the neck. The title, Peploforos, refers to the figure's dress or peplos, a classical Greek garment that was made from a single piece of fabric fastened at the shoulders and along the side. In the letter that Norton, uh, from Norton that we read earlier, he actually begins with acclamations about this piece and included a photo of it. He wrote, it is a beauty though the little photo is a libel. This is the Greek female statue I telegraphed about. You see, it is pure Greek of about 500 to 475 BC. It was dug up just a few days ago in Salith's gardens. It will make those who know about Greek sculpture jump with joy. I had to be very spry to get it and it must stay in hiding for a few weeks. P.S. Please consider the feet of the Greek lady whose photograph I send. For their sake alone, she ought to be a Pope. Norton helped Gardner to purchase the extraordinary piece for 68,000 lira, over twice what she paid for the Persephone, due to the remarkable quality of this per, uh, Peploforos piece. Sadly, Isabella would never see the Peploforos sculpture installed in her museum. The Italian government stalled for years before allowing it to leave the country. It was instead displayed in the American Academy of Rome until 1936, when a director's report uh, for the museum uh, reads, in November also came the news that the Italian government had finally consented to grant the export permit for the ancient headless statue of a woman purchased for Mrs. Gardner in 1901. On December 26th, word was received that it had been placed on board an American ship that would stop at Boston. So the sculpture was finally installed according to Gardner's wishes in 1937, 13 years after her death. Along with Persephone, a sculpture of Artemis, who's the goddess of the hunt. I'm sorry, I just lost my place for a moment. Medusa, um, who centers out the courtyard uh, mosaic. This courtyard is intentionally filled with strong and powerful women as designed by the strong and powerful woman who created it. But by the 21st century, we found Persephone sunk so low that she was lost amongst the plants and no longer held a presence the way that the other female figures in the courtyard do. We started to investigate the installation of Persephone during a 2012 project to clean 16 of the courtyard sculptures. Now, as with any conservation treatment project, we had to evaluate these pieces prior to cleaning in order to determine the best uh, method that would accomplish our goals and also be safe for the objects themselves. In the case of Persephone, this was a particularly important consideration because her surface is quite weathered or eroded. We sometimes refer to this as sugared because you risk having granules come off if you rub the surface too much or use water uh, the way that you would see with a sugar cube. This is even more apparent when you compare Persephone's surface with the smooth fine grain surface of the Peploforo sculpture. For a variety of reasons, we chose a laser cleaning tool to clean both sculptures and actually several of the pieces in the courtyard. This is the same kind of laser that is used for removing tattoos. The way that it works is uh, that the equipment produces laser energy, so a high energy beam of light at a wavelength that is absorbed very well by dark materials like dirt or pollution crust or tattoo ink, um, but is not very uh, absorbed very well by marble or skin. The material that you want to remove absorbs the energy, becomes excited and literally blows into little bits. And that's actually the reason why I'm wearing a mask in this image, um, so as not to breathe in the particles. So just a reminder, this is um, long before the pandemic. The laser light can also cause eye damage, so we wear goggles. And for this project, we worked within these little um, 
we called them cabanas that allowed the visitors to see the progress when we weren't working, um, but close us in when uh, while we were. So we would open and close the shades. Using a laser to clean a porous or deteriorated surface uh, like we see on per uh, Persephone can prevent damage because only the dirt and grime layer is affected. And I think you can get a sense of this from uh, this photo where you can see the surface uh, before cleaning is on the back of her head and after cleaning is on the front, but those um, granules of marble stay intact. Uh, and here's uh, now just doing a fun before and after. Here's how you see Persephone uh, uh, looking overall before cleaning and then after the cleaning was complete. And this is the point at which we, we began to think about reinstallation. And while it might've sounded sort of simple to just pick up a piece, um, raise it up or reconstruct the base, it was actually uh, very complicated um, be, due to many factors, including her fragile surface, the sunken base, all of the surrounding plants and access to the courtyard will open to the public. So we consulted many experts from different disciplines to help us answer the question, how are we going to raise a thousand pound sculpture with an extremely fragile surface? With their assistance, we built a project plan and then received funds from a foundation grant that helped us to bring in those experts to carry out the work. So who do you need to move a sculpture like this? The first person we brought in was Ivan Meijer, uh, a monumental and architectural sculpture conservator who has worked with us uh, for over 20 years now on projects such as the recent restoration of balconies on the south side of the palace. So these are the balconies that you see from the cafe patio. And you can see here Ivan is discussing that work with curator of the collection, Matt Silver. Ivan worked closely with me and our conservation team, as well as our preparator, David Callan, to consider all of the options for both supporting and protecting the sculpture during the project. Ivan began by excavating enough of the base so that we could slide a piece of angled steel, which you can see right here, underneath the sculpture. This steel piece was attached to a backing board and would be used to lift the sculpture up. Then David constructed housing around the sculpture to stabilize her during the lift. We identified locations on her surface that were not too deeply carved, so um, more flat surfaces, and um, not too weathered where we could apply bracing, such as these pieces you see here. Next, we brought in a team of rigging contractors who erected a gantry, which is the steel beam that you see above the sculpture. And they used a block and tackle to wrap around the housing and that steel angle I showed you in the last slide to lift Persephone up and away from her base. And then rotate her horizontally onto a cart that we used to bring the sculpture up to the conservation labs. And you'll see in a, a, just a minute why she had to be laid down like this instead of moving her upright. So with the sculpture removed, the next problem to address was the base. For starters, we brought in geotechnical engineers who specialize in the behavior of earth or dirt. One of the first things that they told us was that the soil in the courtyard has likely done most of its compacting at this point. We do not need to worry about further sinking. Then the engineering team then subcontracted to a company that specializes in underground construction who started by excavating the original base, which we had discovered had sunk four feet into the ground. So this black line shows you where the ground level was when we began. They also found that the base was supported by a wider platform made of brick that you can kind of see peeking out here. That platform should have prevented this much sinking, but the soil in this area was likely softer and didn't support it. Just to give you a sense of scale, here's the hole that was dug uh, to get the base out during excavation. Then they brought in piles uh, that are actually like giant drill bits, which allows for rotation of the piles while applying pressure with this device without vibration or even much noise. And I think many of us are familiar with pile driving that really is sort of slamming down. Um, in fact, that's how the new wing of the museum was constructed. But this technique um, was quite smooth and that is very key when you're working in the center of a museum. 
Each of these pieces was about seven feet long and each pile required four sections stacked up. So that totaled 28 feet down into the ground to get to a clay layer that would hold them in place. And here you can see the tops of four separate piles that were put in place, followed by rebar that was used to support a concrete uh, cap or platform that provided a surface on which to catch, cast a new concrete base. The next question was, how high do you make the base? And in, where exactly does it go, especially once the sculpture has moved away? Well, before we removed the sculpture, we brought in yet another expert, a surveyor who pinpointed her exact location in the courtyard. We also told him that the goal was to make the collar of Persephone's tunic meet the collar of the Peplophorus figure across from her. If the Peplophorus had a head, this would allow them to be able to look eye to eye. The surveyor gave us a benchmark height using this column since it was a fixed point. And the contractors then used a laser measuring tool to determine exactly how high to cast the new base. And the angle of this photo is a little bit off, um, but let me assure you that we did not measure twice. We measured at least 10 times to be sure that it lined up exactly with this spot because once it was done, it was done <clears throat> and it was dead on. In the meantime, uh, up in the labs, Ivan had drilled two holes in the bottom of the sculpture in order to sink stainless steel pins for securing it. The locations were chosen slightly back from center because this is where uh, Persephone's legs raise up, making it a thicker and stronger section of the sculpture. He then drilled counter holes in the base, again, very carefully measured out to make sure that they would line up with the pins. And now also you see why it was that we needed for the sculpture to lie down um, so that we could gain access to the bottom. And now we've come to the final moments in returning Persephone to her rightful place. We brought our rigging crew back um, in to carefully, oh dear, I've lost my screen one second. Okay, um, to carefully, <clears throat> lift her up once more and rotate her back upright before easing her over a new base. And just to point out the skill of this rigging team, and we've worked with them um, quite a bit on other projects, they uh, perfectly estimated the height of the gantry so that the pins that you see here um, just cleared the base by, by millimeters really. Next, Ivan added in some slow setting mortar around the pinholes. And then David removed enough of the support structure so that Nat could check the location. And like I said, there was not a lot of wiggle room at this point, but her base was not perfectly flat. So it was important and possible to change her tilt. And we wanted to get that just right using um, some wedges before that mortar set. So now let's go back to where we started by looking at Persephone earlier this year and then seeing where she stands now. She's no longer sinking into the underworld and no longer lost amongst the plants and flowers, which is so fitting as Persephone's return to the earth signifies her mother Demeter's joy and the springtime growth. Uh, for another comparison, we can look at the whole installation before we began the project and now looking at it after. These images show how key the placement of these figures is to how we experience the courtyard. We are witnessing the proper balance that Gardner intended between each sculpture and are struck by the true power of their presence. Now, there's one more little plot twist to this story. This gentleman here um, was a member of the pile driving crew. And when their team arrived on the scene, you have to imagine the sculpture was already gone and up in the labs. So he asked me what the sculpture was, and I replied, the Greek goddess Persephone. He looked a bit surprised and then calmly told me that was an incredible coincidence because his wife was due to give birth any day or really any minute during this project. And if it was a girl, they had planned to name the baby Persephone. I have to admit, I, I didn't quite believe him. I thought maybe he was just giving me a hard time. Um, but a few days later, he sent me this photo of baby Persephone born just as the project was wrapping up. 
And the father was quoted about baby Persephone in a fantastic article published in the Sunday arts section of the Boston Globe. He says, she has the voice of a goddess, Hades himself would tremble at it, uh, which was just kind of a wonderful ending to this whole story. So I invite you all to visit the museum, Persephone and her courtyard companions to see for yourself this space as Isabella Gardner intended. And of course, right now we have the added bonus of the beautiful chrysanthemum season. So thank you all so much.